Okay, everyone. Well, welcome back to the Journey of Integral Recovery. And I'm John Dupuy. This is Douglas Prater, our producer and, and co-podcaster. I guess that's a word. And we have back by popular demand, Dr. Charles Flores. And for those of you who have seen, and what we're episode 33 now or something like that? Mm -hmm. 33. Episode 33, which is a divine number and kind of number divinity numerology that's thing. I have no idea what that's about. But anyway, uh, um, the last time it was so inspirational and there was so much. And Charles, you have such a deep education and deep experience and deep you know, personal practice and a deep path of service in the field of addiction that it's just like we were unable to, to just even scratch the surface. Maybe we scratched the surface quite effectively. But here we're back again. And one of the... Um, uh, a question that I've really been uh, kind of struggling with at this point, and I think you would um, have a really informed perspective on this, is what do you think about the legalization of marijuana? And how are you seeing it reflect in your clients and in the population at large? Right, right. Wow. So that's a uh, go right for the hot topic, right? Wow. Especially in my state. And I'm, I know in Colorado and many of the states that have legalized. Yeah. Nevada. I mean, we're surrounded by, I'm in Utah. Uh, uh, you're in North, South Carolina, Doug? Uh, North Carolina. Yes. North South. Anyway, Carolina. So, yeah. So, so what, what are your, what are your feelings about this, uh, Charles? So um, complex <laughs> it's a, a complex so they're you know and what if we're going to talk about integral recovery we, we're look, we, we can look at it through these different lenses and so on the one hand uh you know we're, we're we are dealing with this thing called, of legality is something legal or not legal and if if the purpose is to reduce uh the drug use then which is better Right, so if we just look at just that narrow band of things, um, we can pretty safely say that uh, making things illegal hasn't really uh, assisted uh, in in getting people not to use drugs. <laughs> it, Boy, that's that the truth. That the you know the legality on on its face doesn't do that, and you know as we know we're talking about spiral dynamics. That's the blue, right? It's the blue imposition. Here's a law, bad. Drugs are bad. Don't do it. Right. And, uh, we're dealing with addiction. We're dealing with a hyperactive amygdala in our brains. The people who are in that in that state are not paying attention too much to the laws. And if they are, they're trying to get around them and see how they can circumvent them. So, um, so yes. And then when you have something that's illegal that creates the uh, illicit uh, drug trade, uh, creates a you know whole subculture. And a lot of people incarcerated, most often people of color. Sure. So there's that. So that is that whole. There's that whole dimension. But I also look at it from the standpoint of a therapist who is involved with this, mm -hmm. and I see how, unfortunately, I look at messaging, and what I see with clients who come in the door, who walk in the door in my office or in my programs, um, particularly with young people. Remember, young people and their development is, you know, they're young to start with, and then they have arrested development that they've been using. So they're de you're dealing with sometimes a 17-year-old go going on eight years old. Yeah. Thinks, or she thinks weed is fine. It's, a, you know, it's, it, weed is, a, is an herb. It's, it's natural. natural. <laughs> it's all, um, you know, and it's legal. Now, yeah. now they somehow they omitted the parts not legal for you <laughs> yeah. more than alcohol but the fact is there is a kind of uh messaging uh whether it be colorful rappers for little kids whether it, it um, uh, a lot of the certain rappers certain individuals uh certain uh are promoting uh cannabis in, in, in a way that it, you know it, it does filter through and uh and frankly in some cultures there could be generations of drug use and so now they have they're growing the cannabis in the house or in the yard and you're expecting them to go to school and not be high when they yeah. show up and as i mentioned in the last episode there are some real severe impacts for younger people up below the age of 25 right. before the 
uh, neocortex and those parts are developed. Right, like, like Jung said about, about therapy, you shouldn't start until you're at least 40. So you should wait to have your first joint when you're 40 years old. That might work, you know. And uh, so maybe the que- one of the questions to kind of frame this: Do you think the legalization of marijuana in California is is solving more problems than it's causing problems? I mean, is it you know, and and the great tally is it you know? And personally, I think that alcohol is a lot worse drug than marijuana. Okay. And, uh, and again, marijuana, I don't smoke, mar- you know, if, if I smoked marijuana, I'd weigh 300 pounds, I'd be paranoid. And, you know, it's just awful for me. And so I don't understand why people like it so much, because whatever effects they're having must be different from mine, because I get paranoid, I feel miserable, I want to eat everything in creation. So, but, but, you know, I would rather deal with a pothead than a severe alcoholic. You know, and, you know, alcohol has been the cultural, traditional thing, you know, from from Europe, et cetera, that's been going on since. In fact, they just um, discovered wine vats someplace in the in Near East that were 6,000 years old. So that puts wine back like 4,000 years earlier than they actually thought it was. And so, anyway, it's been around in culture for a long time. So, so is this a good thing? Should we make it illegal again? What do we do? So, so here's the thing. I, I, when I talk to clients about this. I talk to staff, supervisors, and, and other therapists about it. I said, one thing is that it's helpful when I teach my courses at Cal State, we talk a little bit about the history. And that, you know, so from the level of if we went to indigenous cultures and these substances existed in nature, there were, you know, people, as you say, 6,000 years ago were fermenting and they were taking plants. Uh, and using them for different uh, things is, you know, we have a natural botanical in nature and in our brains, by the way, we have natural pharmaceutical in our brains. Um, And so indigenous cultures have been using this for, yes, for thousands of years, uh, for ceremonial purposes, for all kinds of of things that, you know, where you didn't hear 6,000 years ago about, you know, uh, uh, inebriate uh, asylums and that sort of thing. You didn't hear about that because what happened was in Europe, we started to get into this thing called distillation. Mm -hmm. We started to make it stronger. That's right. The chemical composition. So there's the plant that's out in nature that's been there for millions of years. And we can make that 10 times stronger, 100 times stronger, 1,000 times stronger. And then we can crossbreed things. And we can make it, we have all these processes. So yeah, you think that felt good. Well, we can make it that much better. That's right. You know, until relatively recently, people were drinking mead and ale and, you know, it, and wine and the alcohol content was pretty low. It wasn't until probably the late 1500s, early 1600s, that gin and whiskey and rum and all this hard liquor. And man, that just wiped people out, you know, in I mean, just London, the, the plague of just gin mills and people just, you know, wiped out. And over here in the United States too, that's when they started their prohibition because men were just drinking all this hard liquor, abandoning their families, beating up their wives or children. It was, it was just horror. And of course we tried to, you know, we tried to just say no more enough. And of course that led to all kinds of uh, new issues and yeah. what it didn't do was stop people from drinking and it, and it gave rise to, the mafia and the underworld and organized crime, which we've never gotten rid of since then. Sure. So, so yeah, so getting, you know, exactly. So that history is there. And to know that a lot of times the plants in them of themselves are not, they're not evil. Like, you know, people in Bolivia, Peru have used coca leaves for thousands of years for altitude sickness and headaches and things. And they just put a few leaves or make some tea out of it. They didn't, break it down and make it into cocaine and then take the cocaine and make it into crack. They didn't do that for thousands of years. This is a relatively recent phenomena. Same with, you know, poppy seeds and, 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 you know, that, that opium being turned into heroin into, you know, these other things and, and our pharmaceutical industry. So what's happened is even with cannabis, we say, I, I tend to steer away with one is worse than the other because everyone is different number one, we have different reactions of different things. Yes, that's right. And uh, cannabis is not the cannabis of our grandparents. You know, I knew- I I stopped smoking in 72, all right? You know, (laughs) and and that stuff was kicking my ass. And now they say the the THC content is just so 
it, I, I would, I, I, I shudder to think what I would do if I was smoking some of the stuff. That right. So these kids are right. eating edibles and having blunts of things with THC levels that are, you know, factors of content of THC higher than anything Cheech and Chong was smoking in 1968. You know, it's like, it's, so I kind of say no, and especially if you're under 25 and your brain's developing, this, this is as bad as taking anything. You know, I don't, no. go, I don't say that, oh, one is better or worse. And I also am very strong against tobacco and nicotine for a lot of reasons. Yes, for, absolutely. You know? So there's a, you know, there's a lot of reasons to steer away from uh, the abuse of these drugs, you know. Um, I think there's a correlate there with um, high-speed internet pornography. And, and tube sites and things that people are doing, you know, stimulation that 20, 30, 50 thousands of years ago was never even possible. And it changes the brain in ways that That's we never true. could have predicted. Well, it, it, a serious it, it, problem. even deeper than that, you know, because I, you know, I've talked to clients about this. I said, you know, they, they look at me, it's like, Hey, why are you using this binaural or this or that? And I said, because you're, you're going to be using this technology anyway. You're on the, you're on the freaking you're on your smartphone texting, you're on uh, your you know, TVs, your computer screens, and all that stuff. Why not use it for something that's going to be helpful to you? Why not take that and use an app that actually is going to uh, enhance your recovery rather than exacerbate it? You know, and I treat a lot of people with porn addiction, uh, internet addiction, um, you know, gambling, all these yeah. things. And that's kind of a that's also electronic because slot machines and, uh, you know, I mean, it, it becomes like almost this monotony, you know, of cigarettes, booze, and pressing the button for the slot machine. Ching, ching, ching. Or, or playing cards. You know, when I was in grad school, one of my jobs, I was a security guard at a casino in the Bay Area. They had this little town in the East Bay where, you know, it's like about 10 acres and it's illegal to gamble. There. So they have all these, it was Texas Hold'em or something. And my job was to to walk the big winners out on the night shift out to the parking lot. So they get rolled in the parking lot. They could get off property without getting mugged. <laughs> and of course we didn't have many big winners. So it was, I didn't have a lot to do, but watch. And I was like, uh, -uh I ain't going here, man. I saw, I saw the whole addictive process. And of course, gambling is also, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, fueled by alcohol and cocaine and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's not just, it's just, but it and was that's in the casinos. Now there's in, there's internet gambling too. Yeah, absolutely. Huge. And then fantasy sports. That's another thing I've been working on treating. You know, it's like, you, you know, it's, it starts off free, but it ends up not being free. So you Charles, know? if you were like the, you know, the, the, the God or the dictator of California, would you just say, okay, would you go back to the pot thing and say, make it illegal enough already? I, I think it's hurting that, our that, children. if you're going to make it legal, see, here's the thing in the law, at least in California, in statute was supposed to provide is supposed to provide a lot of treatment for youth and adolescents if you like if you're going to do this there's all this funding that's coming in it's all about the money right so let's get it out of the illegal thing and yeah. bring in the money i think that really the uh it, it, it it's it's a way to regulate it and if you're going to regulate it we need to acknowledge the negative impacts that it does cause absolutely that you know there are people that are severely addicted and impacted that's right by even a substance as can like cannabis which you know yes in indigenous times it was a sacred substance that could be used for certain things and today it's crossbred and you know there's all kinds of and, and the strength is of a different level a lot of people are uh as you know cbd is the part that doesn't get you high that's medicinal and so it's huge in California. A lot of people are using CBD for everything. Um, you know, it's like, well, no CBD for certain things it is really a great thing. Sure. And so I, I don't. I, so I, I think that making it legal is fine, but we need to invest and have more awareness and education around this. It's kind of like knowing, like anything we regulate, whether it's being cigarette, you know, cigarettes, whether it's alcohol, whether it's driving. It's like, yeah, we have we regulate driving, but we Absolutely. need to know that you drive safely and that you're not drunk while you're driving. And that, you know. <laughs> hey, we, man, where I am, we don't even do that with guns. You know, uh, <laughs> Utah's like, but right. Right. Um, so, 
I'm fine with But you it. know, the other, the other point is, is that not everybody who drinks becomes an alcoholic. Not everybody who smokes, you know, you can have a pot, I, mean, I would imagine, you know, you can have a, recreationally, you know, occasionally once a month, you know, once on a weekend, you know, blah, 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 and fine. However, uh, cannabis can be addictive. And I've worked with tons of people who got hooked and can't get out of it. And I one time, the only time I've really had anybody angrily shout at me when I was given a talk was when I, I said, you know, I talked about marijuana addiction and they started screaming, it's not addictive and all this stuff. I said, man, you, you ain't been walking in the neighborhoods I've been walking. So again, it's about responsibility. Do we outlaw alcohol? I don't think that worked. I don't think it's going to happen. But how do, you know, if you have parents who are alcoholics, you're more at risk. If you're, you know, Native American, you're more at risk. I mean, we know all this. So how do, you know, we deal with this complexity? And and Doug, were you going to say something? Yeah, if I could bring one other piece in too, it is how does legalization affect, uh, for example, the arrest rate and the effect that prison time has on families and kids growing up and work histories and the ability to get a job and those kind of factors in the other quadrants of development besides just the addictive capacity and the strength of it. That's true. Yeah. And does it lead to more or less hard drug use? You know, having a marijuana available gives some people they can get high without using, you know, meth or using heroin or using these other substances. And when I was in the Bay Area or before I got there, the number one cash product in, in California was pot. And man, up in Mendocino and everything, you'd see trucks with marijuana plants. I mean, the feds were coming down on it. And then they did. And then they reported that in the streets in San Francisco and Oakland and, and the Bay Area that the hard drug use went way up when the marijuana was no longer cheap or available as it was before. So right, uh, right. any comments on that? But yeah, so what's happened since then is that um, what I see on, on the field in, in, in high schools with young people, um, we drug test them and we are not seeing very much alcohol use because the cannabis is so much easier to get and so much more readily available. And frankly, it's so strong that they don't need anything else. Yeah. Like they don't really need to drink. Like we, we were like, it's really the alcohol use is plummeted because they're just, they're just high on the cannabis. And what we see is a lot of truancy, a lot of them not coming to school, low motivation, all the things that you'd hear about, but at, at a level and a sort of prevalence that is, um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's really pretty, uh, pretty powerful. I mean, you, um, so um, we're doing a lot of education with the youth in the high schools. Um, I do work in the juvenile hall here in Alameda as well. So we have people who are locked down in the uh, max unit and all of them, all of them, all of them were using lots of cannabis before they got in. It's not the cause of their drug use. It's not even why they got in there, but it just kind of shows that they are under an influence while they were doing a lot of things and their judgments were not uh, the best, uh, yeah. probably were impacted by the, the drug. So, you know, it, it's like I said, it's a complex issue. And I totally agree with you, John, about, you know, hey, let's like look at this and um, look at it squarely. It's like, it's not just about you know, legal, not legal. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet about, frankly, I think, about cannabis. And we need to like, at least talk about the same fact sets and what we're really seeing. We are, who are treatment providers are not seeing, oh, it's completely innocent and, you know, nobody's being impacted by it. It's, it really is impacting. I don't know whether it's a gateway or not. I'm, I'm kind of agnostic about that. I heard somebody say, you know, trauma is the gateway uh, drug. So really, we can look at trauma as being, or looking at the ACEs, like looking at the, you know, the, uh, you know, the child, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, adverse uh, childhood experiences as being like the first predicator before marijuana or anything else. Well, um, you know, the, the, I think the thing is that human, humanity is the gateway because we want, you know, we, we crave altered states, you know, we want to get out of ourselves, you know, we want ecstasy, you know, we want to get away from the stasis and, and get into these higher levels. And of course, here at I Awake, we've been dealing with, you know, Doug just 
did this great suite of, of tracks. If you haven't got it yet, it's called Stealing Flow. And it's, it's, it's not the deep kind of meditative interior thing. It's just to get your mind working and get you in flow states when you're writing, creating, doing sports or whatever. I freaking love them, you know? And yeah. when I get high, it's like talking to you doing this podcast. After the podcast, we're all like, oh, that was <laughs> wonderful. And we don't get hung over. You know, maybe we feel a little emptied and, you know, tired, but in a good way. Like just, you know, you played tennis or something or you worked out. And, and so we need to acknowledge that and start finding ways uh, for people to, to achieve these states uh, in, in healthy ways that, that are, are productive and promote, and promote health and creativity and goodness and morality and love and beauty. And maybe, maybe the, in, 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 the, in the long term, the things that we're learning in integral recovery will be most helpful if we start working with people when they're kids before they start taking drugs and get them having an integral practice and a deep meditative state and learning yeah. to be great musicians and athletes and writers and artists and doctors or whatever their callings are. And once you, you know, they say morality is what you do when you belong, when you're a stakeholder, you know, you don't, you know, you don't shit in your living room because it's your home. That's where you meet, you know, you don't, you know what I mean? It's like, you don't destroy because that's your family. That's your people. That's your country. That's your planet. As you expand these things. And when we make people stakeholders and say, you do matter. And this is how you become the best version of yourself. And that's the most exciting drug. And that's the most exciting story. And this is how you do it. And we're going to walk this path together. And then we could start maybe knocking down 50% of the people that start this thing or 60%. Yeah. And, you know, start making some progress in, 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 in changing the way we're evolving as human beings. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm totally with you with that. And, you know, and I look at going to the more social um, component of and cultural um, collective. Uh, what we see is a lot of times that um, people are coming. We've mentioned in the last uh, talk where, where they're at a deficit. They're starting with something that's really a deficit that, um, you know, there is trauma that can be passed on through generations. Totally. It's, you know, it's not just the addiction or the alcohol or the thing that we've talked about with genograms for a long time, but really kind of saying like, wow, this stuff is, and generations of people that have felt disempowered. Mm -hmm. And they, so what the kid is getting at a very early development phase is not a sense of empowerment. You know, they're living in what was, it, what, you know, we call uh, some of these places ghettos. And what is a ghetto? Ghetto is not part, you're not getting the, your slice of the pie. That's you right. are outside of that. You're yep. disconnected from that. You don't have, it, you know, in, the nor in, in a certain place, you'll have the Whole Foods and you'll have the, you know, the nice markets and you'll have the nice stores. If you're in the ghetto, you get the smoke shop, which has the place where, you know, you get your paraphernalia. And you get your, uh, you know, you buy your shirts and you buy your uh, junk food. And that's what you got. You got no fresh stuff, you know, no fresh vegetables. And if you want any future or power, you join a gang. Because those are the guys that are calling the shots, yeah. you know, or, you know. Survival, you better join. And, and another thing I wanted to ask you, now you came out of the Bronx, okay, out of a pretty rough neighborhood. Now, how did drugs impact you? when you were growing up and then you had a special program that you got into with, with gifted kids and they, you know, you obviously you jumped on it and allowed you to go to good schools and, and you just took your opportunities and bless your heart. You know, you didn't become an investment banker. You became a healer and you went back to the very people that needed you, you know, and that's in a different way. And yeah, absolutely. Human beings. <laughs> Not in, although, yeah. Investing your money is a good idea too, um, but not, uh, bad. not a bad thing. Um, but uh, yeah, being in the in the Bronx, well, first you know, you know, I could look at my own family, and you know, so and that's been you know when we talk about like self care and all that, I, I think being a good therapist or a counselor or somebody who's being supportive in this, you're in this process. You're in this process of reflection. I had a lot of trauma that happened in my family. If I went back to my parents, my grandparents, um, there are lots of things that happened. I don't need to get into details, but you know, one of the outcomes of that is that my dad was an alcoholic. And so I grew up with my parents, you know, uh, with a lot of uh, 
you know, a, a lot of fighting and there's a lot of issues around that. And uh, of course, my environment, you know, was full of people who are using and, and, and drug using and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I remember at that time, part of what kept me, uh, you know, I, I kept, you know, I was an introvert. I am an introvert. So I, I kept, I started getting into books, reading books and protecting my little fiefdom. Yeah, um, there you go. My, my sanity, like, okay, I'm going to read about uh, astronomy or I'm going to read about, and, and that, and, 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 and engaging in active fantasy, like a fantasy life. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, the, I'm not too crazy about what's going on in the world I'm seeing, but it's pretty interesting internally. And I started to develop a subjective sense that was, you know, a reality that was different than what I was seeing. Um, and through books, I was able to have that imagination as well. Um, and so, you know, we, I, I, when I look at our clients that are in recovery, uh, what, they, what they're doing, when they have... Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're coming in, they're using drugs. We have to remember that the, they may have had adverse childhood experiences and they may be for generations, but they also have resilience. There you go. They're there. They got to your program, your office. They're, you know, they want, they're wanting to do something different. They may have made a lot of mistakes. They may have made, have a lot of mistakes with their kids and they have a lot of guilt about that. But there was a resourcefulness that they had just to do the drugs and there's a resourcefulness that got them there because they're still alive. They're still there. And, you know, part of what we, our work is to really look at that and seeing like, here are these skills and things that you've built up. Here are ways that you tried to cope with these sometimes awful things that happened in the past. Yeah. And how do you, how do we turn that around? How do we reframe that? How do we write a new script, a new story of recovery? How you turn the page, you write a new chapter, how that resourcefulness now pulls the tide in your favor. There's a lot of growth and shift and change language that comes in what we talk about yeah. with recovery. So that's, we take that with that installation of hope is taking those circumstances. And I lived through it. That was, you know, part of my, you know, I started off with that protection, but then I started to take opportunities and actually see that there were different realities than what I was seeing. You know, it wasn't just like the bodega down the street from me. Oh, wow, people are living like this. You know, I have relatives that live in the suburbs or people in Manhattan have millions and billions of dollars and they're living completely different lives, you know, and it's just a subway uh, right away for me. So um, that started to expand my world and reality. Um, and, um, and then a lot of times the, the, you know, the work on the family, uh, the stuff that you see in 12, uh, there are certain 12 step groups like uh, adult children of alcoholics, yep. mm -hmm. Al-Anon, where you're really working with the, uh, what was behind the AA and the NA is like recovery is larger than just not using the drug. Yeah. You know? Right. If you're not yeah. the identified patient, you know, you're still a victim of this disease. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you, you you may not be have ever picked up any drug, but you may still carry a lot of the patterns and tendencies that the family of an alcoholic or dysfunctional family, yeah. and you're carrying it on generation to generation, not being conscious of it. You're behaving in a certain way, and what you know it, it because it's not conscious, you can't change it. You see it as as one way, and that's the only way. And it's for a lot of people, the drugs are a big part of it, but there could be many other addictions. There sure. could be an addiction to violence, which we haven't talked about, but that is something Absolutely. I deal with a lot of folks. I, I work with people that come out of prisons and, you know, and they, it's, it's a kind of co-occurring. It's like, there's your drug and then there's the- Yeah, you're, you're, you're addicted to the chaos that is associated with the drug lifestyle. You know, exactly. the violence, the cops, the running, the, you know, mugging i mean the whole thing that gets to be you know that man that gets your adrenaline and and all this stuff going and that becomes part of the high you know? right exactly so so i agree with you it's all about this high thing and we're trying to shift a high which is this quick high with any kind of hook that we keep repeating over and over and over again to get that little buzz and, and after a while it doesn't work anymore it, you know that's the mm -hmm. thing we develop tolerance Right. That's so right. 
we develop that tolerance. So you, it, hey, it kind of worked for you, or maybe it got you by in that tra traumatic situation, but it's no longer working for you. Hey, you know what? And, and the, 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 the opposite of that, or the, I mean, that's kind of the fall side of it, but true human development, okay? For example, if you're a Roger Federer, uh, tennis is a lot much, it's more fun than if you're like, <laughs> you can't manage to hit the ball when it comes by. I mean, just starting out. It's much more fun to be a really good guitar player and get into a zone and just be able to express your soul than just like, okay. E chord, you know, I'm trying to say, <laughs> oh, that hurts. Seeing oh, that sounded crappy, and you know, I got to press harder, you know, at that level. And so, with, with true development and authentic happiness, the better we get, the deeper that we go into it, the greater the rewards, the greater the satisfaction, the greater the joy, the greater the sharing, the greater the giving. The drug is just the opposite, you know, it starts off and then you chase the high, and the lows get lower, and the and you know, and and the highs get less often. And, and then you have to mix and how do I get back to that original? I'll do speed balls, this balls and that balls. And, and then I have to take this to try to come down and feel better the next day. So I can start again. It's just, you know, that, that whole syndrome. I um, love, uh, yeah. I love how you're kind of uh, showing the, the inverse relationship between, and they're basically different kinds of uh, living life, right? It's a different reality. I tell you, I, always, go, I, be, I'm, I keep on thinking I'm stepping on you. Have a question or a comment? Oh, I wanted to just make one comment. It, it, uh, when I tell my clients regarding this, I said, even, every, every expert was once a beginner. Absolutely. There's a, a concept that I've read about. Maybe uh, the two of you know about this or, or could elaborate a little bit, but it's um, the idea of, I think, hormesis is how you pronounce it. And it is whatever action you take, whether it's pleasurable or painful, is immediately followed by a period that is on the opposite side of the curve. So you do something that that feels good and you're up here and then the snapback is way down here on the other side of that. You do something like uh, do a project that you don't want to do. You sit down to write and it's really hard and it's painful, or you get in a cold shower for a few minutes and it's painful and terrible. And then the period immediately following that, there is a, a positive um, build to it, a, a good feeling that is the opposite of what you just went through. And I think that's one of the most important ways we can use these growth practices to get this longer curve on the positive side instead of the longer curve on the negative side. Well, I'm going to do a little plug because, and, and I don't know, you know, I think it was mentioned, uh, stealing flow, you know, that I awake does. I don't know what the secret sauce is in that, but, but actually what it does. And then, and I, I, I really sort of have to say, it's like when you're in that grudgy kind of like, Ooh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to write this. I don't want to, that. there's something about, <laughs> that on that seems to smooth it out and i'm not even sure what it is but it, it kind of like oh suddenly i'm like and i get over the hump and i'm in it and i'm doing it and i'm like and i'm gonna roll and i just don't i don't really know what it is but it, it's like you know there are ways that we can naturally what it does but what, what i love about the uh the, the binaural stuff is that it's not a substance going into your brain it is sound, which all the great traditions have talked about, like mm -hmm. sound, the world is vibration, and it's using your own natural pharmaceutical that is in your brain already. It's tapping into that thing that's there. So you're, you know, you're going through the, and then it just kind of goes in and you're smoothed out. Suddenly you're past the hump. And, uh, you know, no batteries required except for the battery in your iPhone, you know, so... <laughs> You know, and I think we have to we have to make the story of human development and you know the integral practice and human potential that is accessible and doable, not just as some you know some really you know ivory tower esoteric idea, but as a potential for each individual from from the time they're young and we're learning what you have to train and what you have to do as an ongoing thing and make that story more powerful and make that reality uh, more real than the tragic, you know, the, the pseudo highs and the pseudo accomplishments and the pseudo uh, joy that you get for drugs temporarily and then very quickly leads to your demise and, and, and just exponentially increasing the suffering and the pain and the despair. Right. That, right. that story needs to get, and you know, the next book I'm writing is all about, it's integral recovery for everybody. 
you know, that's the book that we're doing. And uh, the practice of life, I think, is what we're calling it right now. And that's a really, really freaking good story, you know, and that's a really, really cool thing. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. It's right there. And those of us who have, who have, you know, adopted the practice and people say, why do you meditate so much? Well, it's so fucking screwed up, you know, so depressed. I was, you know, I was ready to kill myself. So I really had to do it, you know, seriously, as if my life depended on it. Why? Because my life did depend on it. That got me to the game. But for those of us who have done that, I know that was one of the things when, in fact, with Doug, how we met, I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast, I got this brilliant email from, you know, like six pages long, and I went, I have to write a book to answer this thing. Let's, let's, let's do a Skype call. And so I did that. And then we talked and then I said, well, you want to do it again next week and every week. And so then we started, we just started meeting and talking about these things on Skype. And then it came up that we needed somebody to help us in the company. And I said, well, okay, we're sending out to our list. What are the skill sets? And I said, well, yeah, what about Doug? You know, and then it, it turned out that he had gifts and things that I hadn't even no clue. So anyway, it was just that connection. But the thing that I think that really connected to us that Doug, who's also in recovery, well, I'm not in recovery from, from drugs, though I did have my tail feathers burned by that when I was young. I got out of it, thank God. But, but was the, the, the dedication to practice and, and understanding that we're better and we've achieved more and that we're, you know, we're, we're engaging with the world in a meaningful way that wasn't available to us until we discovered the key you know, of, of practice and integral practice. You know, you got to work the body, you got to work the mind, the emotional stuff, your trauma stuff, and you have to work the, uh, you know, the spiritual line, and then you have to give it back to the world. You know, it's not enough just to be spiritual materialism, as the man said, you know, you have to put the package together and then engage in your time with your people on your planet for those who came before us, for those who are here now, and for those who come after us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the work we're doing is filling all that out because that's a big task. That's a lot of stuff, you know, before, <sighs> after, you right. know, all society, the world. But um, it, it's, you know, what I part of what I love about this field too is that, um, you know, and you know, it can be a little different with mental health. A lot of times, that's disease model. You're depressed. You're whatever. But in recovery there can be really a positive message that comes out of it. And it's a lifelong kind of process. You know, there are people I've talked to, it's like, oh, well, it's a disease and it, uh, you're making it like it's a death sentence. And, you know, when are you recovered and all that? And I said, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't use the word recovery. Maybe we need to use the word discovery. Yeah. You know, because, <laughs> you know, once you've stopped using the drugs, then you, there's a, the end. The work doesn't end. <laughs> you're, you're no, that's of, just the beginning. That's just your yeah. ticket to get in. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of times the, the drug uh, addiction or, or non-drug addiction is the gateway for people to suddenly open up and to sort of widen into these larger uh, possibilities for themselves. And, uh, and I think what Integral does is that, you know, and I, and I do it at many levels it's with clients one-on-one, -on -one, but then there's like my staff or people I work with or other people. It's like, Hey, there's a, there's a, you know, when we're dealing with recovery, there's many levels to this. There's a, there's a social level, there's social policy that has a direct impact on us. Yeah. You know, there are things that we need to be aware of. It, you know, there's a lot of unscrupulous uh, companies out there that are taking advantage of, people who are desperate, who are in recovery, who are homeless, scooping them up, putting them into basically almost a human trafficking kind of situation. They're in, they're in a so-called recovery home and then they're shipped back and forth to a so-called program and they're scamming Medicaid, you know, um, and they're trying to, you know, it's like the Florida model basically, and they're exporting that. When you're aware of that, then you realize a lot of these people continue to be victimized. And to be, um, we need to be advocates for those of us who are in this field. Um, and we need to protect those who are, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great, you know, part of that recovery thing is to have this awareness of the larger uh, issues involved, funding for things. Um, you know, so that's why I'm so, I do so much work in uh, Sacramento. I'm, you know, the board of directors of CCAP at, in California, which is the one of the credentialing agencies for drug and alcohol counselors, because we have to get involved with that. That's a part of our, we do that for our membership, which really is a sort of promote 
uh, the larger field of recovery and really make a larger impact. It's not just the one-on-one -on -one, and it's not just the program, it's the larger picture because this is a huge, huge problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and one, you know, one thing that occurred to me, uh, I can't remember who triggered this in me, but you know, I tell, sometimes I've talked to clients about, uh, we have to remember or sort of get a context that the modern world as we see it, you know, Ken talks about, Ken Wilber talks about this. You know, we, in the last couple of hundred years, we're living in an age of electronics that didn't exist before in all of history, right? We are living in a constant 60 megahertz, you know, electronic vibration. When we're living in cities in particular, yeah, if we go way out in the mountains, we may not feel it, but there's a hum going on that's impacting us at all times. And we are constantly bombarded with what we know, social media, television, and computers, and all that stuff. And yes. that has sped us up. We're not, you know, the yogis of the past used to have a much lower blood pressure and were able to do that because they were living in a completely different world. Yeah. You know, they didn't have this influence. And so that has, I think, there hasn't been studies on this, but I think it common sense would make, you know, that when we're living in that uh, field that, uh, and we're speeding up that the, in order to cope with our biology, which hasn't yeah. caught up to the changes, Many times people take pills, they take substances in order to cope with the speed and, 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 and it's like a whole meta uh, issue aside from trauma and all that is that our civilization itself has created in part some of the symptoms that we see, which a lot of people, uh, you know, they have addictions in relationship to that because they are living in essentially we were, we're basically biologically still tribal peoples, you know? No, no. And I, I, I see homeless people and I go, man, there, but for the grace of God, uh, you know, one degree or another, I could have been me, you know, because it's like, it's really hard to keep all these balls going that you have to, to you know, you've got to pay your bills. You got to pay your insurance. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to save, you, you know, you have to automobile on a house and all the complexity of thing, you know, and, and some, some of the, you know, the escape, well, let's just go back and be, you know, let's be, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, let's go back to the Stone Age or something and live in a little hut and, you know, and, and do sweat lodges. And I don't think it's going to work, but it's, it's very, very complex. And I think it, uh, I think it needs to get, um, we need to need a little more compassionate, you know, and it's like in, in the, in the Bodhisattva sense in Buddhism, you know, nobody's enlightened until we're all enlightened. You know, nobody's sober till we're all sober. Nobody's safe until we're all safe. Nobody's loved until we're all loved. And, and just expand that and stop seeing human beings as objects to be manipulated in order to increase your power, your wealth, your excitement, your sexual, whatever it is. And see, you know, that's our brothers and sisters and we're one family. And, that, you know, expand that beyond the human, you know, right. too, that all creatures deserve to be a part of this dance. And we just, you know, we've got some really kind of toxic, weird shit that's come up through the competitive capitalism, industrial, post-industrial, these things. And it's like, it's not about, you know, ending, you know, all the, the, the tinker toys. It's about allowing all creatures to live in dignity, you know, and what is dignity? I don't know, but I know when I see it, it's like the, 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 um, the Supreme Court justice. I don't know how to describe pornography, but I know it when I see it, you know, dignity is kind of the same way, you know, the basic, the basic things are there, the, but more than that, you know, there's belonging, there's compassion, there's love, there's meaning, there's an essential understanding of what it really means to be alive and to be a human being in, in, in the deepest sense and the shallowest sense and everything in between sense. And then we, then we can, and, and, and if we, either we're going to get it at some point or we're not because we're going to blow each other up. You know, there's just too much stuff. So we've got to grow up. We have to involve and, and, um, uh, man, yeah. there's, that's There's the wake jump. up, grow up, show up, clean up, you know, yeah. process. You know, yeah, that, absolutely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a societal level, there's a systemic dehumanization of addicts to people who perhaps need help the most that we try to distance ourselves from. You know, somebody gets into trouble and goes to prison for a while, and then for the rest of their life, everything is harder to to get a job to get out of debt to get back on a path to doing right you drop one of those balls once you're forever labeled and that's where this path of healing and rehumanization comes in and 
we can do that as individuals, but that's where we need to shift the way society and, and our systems look at and address the problem too. Yeah. yeah and and if people do deserve to be in prison or something. They should be like integral training <laughs> places, you know, where you go to get better and not where you go to make more, you know, learn, you know, more, more underworld contract uh, contacts or, you know, learn how to be a, you know, or have to guard yourself and become a more sociopathic sociopath or something. There should be places where people are coming out regenerated and with yeah. tools to, to deal with the world, education. And, and of course, all the things we're talking about, body, mind, spirit, uh, motion, shadows, our stories, you know, we just, we've got to practice. We've, and, and, and I'm again, you know, I've been saying this for years and I'm not the only one, but I, I, enough of the anonymous shit. Okay. You know, addicts are us. I mean, your father, you know, it's like, uh, my family, my, you know, it's like that it's, you know, and I understand that historically and for certain reasons that was necessary, you know, if the 1950s ago, hi, I'm gay, you know, you probably get shot, but we have made, you know, progress along those lines. So do you have gay anonymous? Well, no. And, and, and maybe in some places you have to hide it. In other words, still, but in, in large, you know, by and large, it's like, so what? You're gay. Well, congratulations. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'm Mexican. I'm white. I'm this or that. It doesn't matter, you know? Uh, and we have to get to that way with, with, uh, with addiction. You know, it's all of us. And, and the only sin about addiction is not taking responsibility for getting well, you know, and that's what we have to say. Just, okay, there's a way out. It's a good path. It's a real path. There's more joy. It's hard. You know, but we're here to work together and and and, mm -hmm. and to do this thing because it's the only job. You know, it's the only game we're playing, really. You know, right, right. I so it's a couple to a couple of things that were said. One is that um, talking about prisons and the people losing, and I totally, um, you know, work with programs that deal with the uh, people who are reentry, trying to make their lives better. But I also work with, like I said, jail, uh, jail to Yale. A lot of times what's not, what goes under the radar are the functional or semi-functional addictions with people who are of upper middle, upper class, doctors, people like that who are causing harm, but have managed to keep their jobs. They manage to sort of get by, but they come into my office. They work at Silicon Valley. They work in, you know, and they look, you look at them, oh, they're respectable people. They're not, you know. And they're educated, and yet these folks are also running on severe impairment, and are you know, and they come to see me. Well, they're looking for something else, but there are a lot more that never show up in an office. Um, so it's not just the people who are imprisoned, and like you know, and, right. and I always look at like the, the different poles of it because you know they have that that pyramid that says like, okay, this is the percentage of you know the most severe that we actually do have treatment for and they're here all these people that are like at risk who are doing some severe drinking they're doing like you know eight ten drinks 14 drinks a, a, a week or more but they're not coming into a treatment program they yeah. never get any sort of treatment they're just quietly they keep their jobs and they're abusing their families and they're doing that so there's a lot of that underground stuff as well so the addictions sort of have their way of going across but they present themselves differently one yeah. is the disenfranchised person as you mentioned which is you know, huge and but you know they they can get representative in community uh community clinics whereas the people who are that i'm talking about may never show up and if they do they don't want to go to a community clinic with the guy with the, the homeless guy they want to be in with the private therapy or the poshy uh rehab maybe if they can afford that they go for that, yeah. Right, right. So there, there's that spectrum, and their addictions may be different. They're looking at more designer drugs, or they're, you know, they're dabbling in um, things that you wouldn't see on the street, the streets of Oakland or the Bronx. You know, they're doing different things. So, so I see it kind of as an epidemic, but it's cross and it appears yeah. differently in different places. Yeah, and and yet you don't. I mean, one of the things you know, say you're a functional alcoholic or functional pot smoker or something like that, you can maintain, but you never become who you could could have been. You know, and that's the great tragedy. You never become the father you could have been. You never the, you know, the wife you could, the mother, the you know, the the whatever that was that thing, a special thing you had to do with your life. You never achieved that, and that's just a bummer. 
just a very sad freaking story and it's heartbreaking you know it, it's really yeah it's really hard and you know uh, yeah have integral centers everywhere that would be uh <laughs> That would be a great, or, or just even shifting the paradigm, because part of what I've done in the last two years is that we have drug and alcohol counselors, not enough, we don't really talk about this a lot of the time. We have drug and alcohol counselors who many times they're in recovery themselves, mm -hmm. most often, they're getting, they get a credential, which is 315 hours or whatever it is in the particular state. They get a, a little bit, a few, some hours, and they get their certificate. And they could have an AA or a BA or perhaps, and that's their education. That's their, that's what they got. And sometimes that's not enough, no. frankly, for the, I, I do a lot of training with, so one thing is that they come out of a, many times they, if they come out of a 12 step uh, perspective, um, they may be looking at denial and sort of a, a more rough approach toward recovery you, know, you need to get your act together or you know you need to you know stop you know denying your problem yeah uh, maybe you need to if you're if you maybe you need to go out there and do some more research right right right, right. so you can hit your bottom you know and sort of like rough kind of at, uh and, and and that stuff we found it's like i understand historically why it was there in counter groups and all that but that stuff doesn't work that doesn't work with most people. I know I've seen them. Making them further does not make them. It's not going to make them better. But a lot of times these guys are, or these you know, certain counselors are coming from that, and it's a real shift to come from this more collaborative approach, from an approach of not I'm the expert and you're the recipient of my services. You should follow what I do. More to more listening more paying attention, more like client driven treatment, more about motivational interviewing, where meeting people where they are, yeah. in each of their areas and creating real plans that you, so you know like what your progress is because you have evidence behind it and starting to think scientifically about it, you know. So all that is, you know, in this field, you know, if we go back, that wasn't happening. You know, and it's really in the last 15, 20 years where we're really starting to see a professionalization. And that's really amped up with, you know, the Affordable Care Act, where now substance use is a part of behavioral health and health care. And so now the payment is going to expect you're doing, you got a diagnosis, you have a medical thing, and you got to be professional about it. This isn't just social model. Let's talk about it. Let's do some steps. It's more scientific. Here, what are you doing? How do we know you're doing it? How do you know if the client's really responding to it? How do you know if they're getting better? And so getting a little in, and I think that is a, a good process without, if, if we don't go too far and get really reductionistic about it, I think that all in all, that's a good thing. And, and get people practicing, you know, and, and get the counselors practicing. And it's like, it's not just for, you know, integral practice, it's not just for you messed up addicts, it's for all of us, you know, and you can, yeah. you can talk as a practitioner, well, this is what I'm doing. These have been my struggle. When I was meditating today, this is what I ran into. And, you know, at the gym and blah, 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 blah. And this is really happening. This is working for me. And I'm having to fix this. And so it's, it's not us against them. You poor, you know, sick people. It's like, we're all, we're just in different stages of development. And, you know, if you have people that are elder and more advanced, they can support and drag the other people and be auxiliary egos for a while until people get into the zone. I mean, it's, you can't just say, here, go do all these practices. You need somebody to be there, you know, to, to right. train them. You know, they, when you get into basic training, they don't just throw you a bunch of bazookas and machine guns and stuff and go, okay, go in the woods and learn how to be soldiers. You know? <laughs> like, right. In the beginning, man, they just say, okay, this is what you got to do, A, B, C, D, you know, and, and step it until they begin to, to, to internalize that. And then they, right. they can take care of themselves. And after a while, then you can start helping take care of others. And you just move to this whole progression of from beginner to – uh, you know, a practitioner to a master. Yeah. There's yeah, a level of trust, authenticity, and mutual respect that comes from knowing that your uh, care provider is in the trenches with you doing the work. They know what they're talking about. And so you believe them. You're more likely to take their suggestions and run with them. Yeah. And addicts being great bullshitters really know 
bullshitters. They can smell it. They they taste it. So that you know, there has to be a authenticity. And this guy knows what he's talking about. And they they give a shit. And it's they're kind of pissing me off. But I better shut up and listen. And hey, uh, I love you know the credential SUD counselors who have their toolbox and their stuff together. They are a force. It's you know especially with early recovery before a lot of the psychiatric stuff hit kicks in. That those first few months for engagement, for connecting, getting the passion in there. If they come in with those tools that, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, and they customize it to the client. They come in with that, man. I mean, they, you know, I think that uh, substance use, you know, certified counselors, when they get that training, when they understand that, they should be as valued as anybody you know, for doing that work. Cause not everybody can do that. Not everybody can engage and really connect with somebody who's been in the throes of that addiction and be able to sort of, you know, go in there, connect with them, get an alliance, be a mentor, be someone who inspires them to like make these shifts and go through all that detox and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's a uh, really uh, sacred work, you know? Yeah. It's like the NCOs in the military. They're the ones that just run the military. You know, it's not the generals and the colonels and all. I mean, you need you need that kind of stuff, but it's the people who are you know have achieved that level of mastery who actually run things day to day, yeah. and everybody knows it, including the officers and the, and the people under them. They are the yeah. heart of it. Hey, I wanted to ask you one thing. We're kind of uh, you're really busy. Do you take clients? Do, uh, could anybody going? Wow, I'd really like to work with Charles. And do they have to live in Oakland? or the Bay area or can you do, do you work online and do stuff like that also? Okay, great. Well, thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have an office in Oakland. I'm on psychology today and I'm on good therapy, uh, dot, uh, dot org. Um, I have listings there with phone numbers and email addresses, uh, Dr. Charles I Flores at yahoo.com. So anybody here can just contact me directly that way, but uh, I have listings. And I also, I do a secure teleconference, uh, you know, so, you know, as you know, with therapy, you have to have, you have HIPAA standards and such, you know, you can't do your normal, you can't do Skype, you know, so it's got to be secure electronic content. And uh, it, you know, basically I'm in the state of California. So, uh, you know, so I'm careful, I'm a therapist. And so I've got my license in the state of California. And if I'm going to do psychotherapy with people, then I'm, that's what I'm doing. But anyone, you know, if you're going to coach, well, then that's a different thing. I can coach people anywhere. So that's a, you know, if somebody just wants to get some advice or whatever, I'm not going to do their psychotherapy if they're living in uh, Florida or something. But, um, but I'm going to, I can talk with them and if they, you know, if they're interested in some of the things I've talked about here, um, certainly arrange something where I can coach them and refer them to uh, resources. Um, yeah, and, and we're uh, we're just building our website and it's there, but we're going to put you on there in our resources list and we should probably put you on there with OC episode 32 and 33 of, yeah. you know, to really get a taste of this guy who you're talking about. And uh, uh, yeah, there's a couple other things I want once we get off the air I want to talk to you about. So, uh, hey, it's about we're about, about time, isn't it? Yeah, we're about there. Okay, Dr. Charles Flores, thank you so much, brother. You're just an amazing presence, and uh, my goodness, what a package. Uh, so, yeah, with all our troubles in the world, and uh, we're still developing people like you, I find that incredibly inspiring. So, uh, anyway, thank you so much, and God bless everybody. Thank you. Keep practicing, and do what you got to do to get well and be the best version of yourself. That's your ultimate gift you have to give to the world, and that's where your authentic happiness and peace and joy lies. So. Uh, Let's all, let's all keep working together. So. Thanks.